which would most certainly injure him, because his capital would be idle, as long as the strike lasted, and his machinery would be rusting, whereas it is very doubtful whether he could, in such a case, enforce his reduction. Then he has the certainty that, if he should succeed, his competitors would follow him, reducing the price of the goods so produced, and thus depriving him of the benefit of his policy. Then too, the unions often bring about a more rapid increase of wages after a crisis than would otherwise follow. For the manufacturer's interest is to delay raising wages until forced by competition, but now the working men demand an increased wage, as soon as the market improves, and they can carry their point by reason of the smaller supply of workers at his command under such circumstances. But, for resistance to more considerable forces which influence the labor market, the unions are powerless. In such cases hunger gradually drives the strikers to resume work on any terms, and when once a few have begun, the force of the union is broken, because these few knob sticks, with the reserve supplies of goods in the market, enable the bourgeoisie to overcome the worst effects of the interruption of business. The funds of the union are soon exhausted by the great numbers requiring relief, the credit which the shopkeepers give at high interest is withdrawn after a time, and want compels the working man to place himself once more under the yoke of the bourgeoisie. But strikes end disastrously for the workers mostly, because the manufacturers, in their own interest which has, be it said, become their interest only through the resistance of the workers, are obliged to avoid all useless reductions, while the workers feel in every reduction imposed by the state of trade a deterioration of their condition, against which they must defend themselves as far as in them lies. It will be asked, why, then, do the workers strike in such cases, when the uselessness of such measures is so evident? simply because they must protest against every reduction, even if dictated by necessity, because they feel bound to proclaim that they, as human beings, shall not be made to bow to social circumstances, but social conditions ought to yield to them as human beings, because silence on their part would be a recognition of these social conditions, an admission of the right of the bourgeoisie to exploit the workers in good times and let them starve. In bad ones. Against this the working men must rebel so long as they have not lost all human feeling, and that they protest in this way and no other, comes of their being practical English people, who express themselves in action, and do not, like German theorists, go to sleep, as soon as their protest is properly registered and placed at actor, there to sleep as quietly as the protesters themselves. The active resistance of the English working men has its effect, in holding the money greed of the bourgeoisie within certain limits, and keeping alive the opposition of the workers to the social and political omnipotence of the bourgeoisie, while it compels the admission that something more is needed than trades unions and strikes, to break the power of the ruling class. But what gives these unions and the strikes arising from them their real importance is this, that they're the first attempt of the workers to abolish competition. They imply the recognition of the fact that the supremacy of the bourgeoisie is based wholly upon the competition of the workers among themselves, I point e, upon their want of cohesion. And precisely because the unions direct themselves against the vital nerve of the present social order, however one-sidedly, in however narrow a way, are they so dangerous to this social order. The working men cannot attack the bourgeoisie, and with it the whole existing order of society, at any sore point than this. If the competition of the workers among themselves is destroyed, if all determine not to be further exploited by the bourgeoisie, the rule of property is at an end. Wages depend upon the relation of demand to supply, upon the accidental state of the labor market, simply because the workers have hitherto been content to be treated as chattels, to be bought and sold. The moment the workers resolve to be bought, and sold no longer, when in the determination of the value of labor, they take the part of men possessed of a will as well as of working power, at that moment the whole political economy of two days at an end. The laws determining the rate of wages would, indeed, come into force again in the long run, if the working men did not go beyond this step of abolishing competition among themselves. But they must go beyond that, unless they are prepared to recede again, and to allow competition among themselves to reappear. Thus once advanced so far, necessity compels them to go farther, to abolish not only one kind of competition, but competition itself altogether, and that they will do. 
the workers are coming to perceive more clearly with every day, how competition affects them, they see far more clearly than the bourgeois that competition of the capitalists among themselves presses upon the workers too, by bringing on commercial crises, and that this kind of competition, too, must be abolished. They will soon learn how they have to go about it. That these unions contribute greatly, to nourish the bitter hatred of the workers against the property holding class, need hardly be said. From them proceed, therefore, with or without the connivance of the leading members, in times of unusual excitement, individual actions which can be explained only by hatred wrought to the pitch of despair, by wild passion overwhelming all restraints. Of this sort are the attacks with vitriol, mentioned in the foregoing pages, and a series of others, of which I shall cite several. In 1831, during a violent labor movement, young Ashton, a manufacturer in Hyde, New Manchester, was shot one evening when crossing a field, and no trace of the assassin discovered. There is no doubt that this was a deed of vengeance of the working men. Incendiarisms and attempted explosions are very common. On Friday, September 29, 1843, an attempt was made to blow up the saw works of Pagin, in Howard Street, Sheffield. A closed iron tube filled with powder was the means employed, and the damage was considerable. On the following day, a similar attempt was made in Ibbotson's knife and file works at Shalesmore, near Sheffield. Mr. Ibbotson had made himself obnoxious by an active participation in bourgeois movements, by low wages, the exclusive employment of knob sticks, and the exploitation of the poor law for his own benefit. He had reported, during the crisis of 1842, such operatives as refused to accept reduced wages, as persons who could find work, but would not take it, and were, therefore, not deserving of relief, so compelling the acceptance of a reduction. Considerable damage was inflicted by the explosion, and all the working men who came to view it regretted only, that the whole concern was not blown into the air. On Friday, October 6, 1844, an attempt to set fire to the factory of Ainsworth and Crompton, at Bolton, did no damage, it was the third or fourth attempt in the same factory within a very short time. In the meeting of the Town Council of Sheffield, on Wednesday, January 10, 1844, the Commissioner of Police exhibited a cast iron machine, made for the express purpose of producing an explosion, and found filled with four pounds of powder, and a fuse which had been lighted, but had not taken effect, in the works of Mr. Kitchen, Earl Street, Sheffield. On Sunday, January 20, 1844, an explosion caused by a package of powder took place in the sawmill of Bentley and White, at Berry, in Lancashire, and produced considerable damage. On Thursday, February 1, 1844, the Soho Wheel Works, in Sheffield, were set on fire and burnt up. Here are six such cases in four months, all of which have their sole origin in the embitterment of the working men against the employers. What sort of a social state it must be in which such things are possible I need hardly say. These facts are proof enough that in England, even in good business years, such as 1843, the social war is avowed, and openly carried on, and still the English bourgeoisie does not stop to reflect. But the case which speaks most loudly is that of the Glasgow Thugs, 221A which came up before the Assizes from the 3rd to the 11th of January, 1838. It appears from the proceedings, that the Cotton Spinners Union, which existed here from the year 1816, possessed royal organization and power. The members were bound by an oath, to adhere to the decision of the majority, and had during every turn out a secret committee which was unknown to the mass of the members, and control the funds of the union absolutely. This committee fixed a price upon the heads of knob sticks and obnoxious manufacturers, and upon incendiarisms in mills. A mill was thus set on fire in which female knob sticks were employed, in spinning in the place of men, a Mrs. McPherson, mother of one of these girls, was murdered, and both murderers sent to America at the expense of the association. As early as 1820, an knob stick named McQuarrie was shot at and wounded, for which deed the dollar received twenty pounds from the Union, but was discovered and transported for life. Finally, in 1837, in May, disturbances occurred in consequence of a turnout in the Oatbank and Myland factories, in which perhaps a dozen knob sticks were maltreated. In July, of the same year, the disturbances still continued, and a certain smith, a knob stick, was so maltreated that he died. 
the committee was now arrested, an investigation begun, and the leading members found guilty of participation in conspiracies, maltreatment of knob sticks, and incendiarism in the mill of James and Francis Wood, and they were transported for seven years. What do our good Germans say to this story? 221b. The property holding class, and especially the manufacturing portion of it which comes into direct contact with the working men, declaims with the greatest violence against these unions, and is constantly trying to prove their useless